Audio video Q&A, the first one for this channel. So I grabbed some of the comments I asked a while back for you to hashtag AVQA. So if you hit me up on uh, Podcast Helper on Twitter, Podcast Helper on Instagram, the DMs are always open. Hashtag AVQA and something I can include in these segments here on this channel. But I grabbed some comments, some of the stuff that I see a lot or just good questions and we're answering them. Peter wants to know, what's your take on the 80D's ISO performance when stacked up against your trusty 60D? Significant or just a tiny difference? All the best, mate. So maybe he's in Australia. Thanks, mate. I do like saying mate, it's fun. Peter, uh, the 80D ISO is pretty good. I mean, I'm shooting on the 6500 and it is much better. Sony does a great job with high espresso sip. Sony does a great job with high ISO shooting, especially the A7S series, but the 80D does a pretty decent job. And compared to my trusty 60D, which is what you've seen most on this channel, it's the camera, it's not the camera I started with. I started with the T2i, then I got the 60D, and I built this channel mostly on that camera. And now I have the 6500 from Sony. But the 60D, I tried not to push past ISO 800. Past that, I started to see noise that I didn't want in my images. Of course, if you need to go past 800 to get the shot, then do it. Uh, I would definitely try to keep it under 1200 on the 60D. But on the 80D, I could shoot double that, I would say. So 1600 was usable. I did one shot in my 80D review doesn't sound ADD, no, ADD review video. I did a shot outside at night at a pub and it was ISO 1000 and it looked really good, especially after color grading. All right, makeup by Anna. How do I focus like where the background is blurred, but you're the main focus without getting out of focus when I move? Well, I can move and be in focus, right? Because the 6500 is tracking my face and it does a good job the 80d that i just mentioned also does a good job at this the 70d where they can really broke through the continuous autofocus uh, they figured it out and it does a good job and there's several other cameras now that do continuous autofocus but i believe this question was asked on a 60d video and on my 60d you didn't, you couldn't. Without doing manual focus, someone behind the camera, I am filming myself, so I'm not gonna be able to adjust that focus, not without a remote or something, even then it's gonna be hard. The bottom line was, I would always set myself up, get my focus, I used a remote to do that. On the 6D it was nice, I could snap, and it would get focus, and I'd be in focus, but if I'm sitting here, I couldn't move around, because I would go out of focus. So if you wanna be at that really shallow depth of field, you have to stay still and be careful not to be too shallow because just a little bit of movement and you could be off. DSLRs are great for low light. They have bigger chips. They have uh, lenses, detachable lenses that have bigger apertures, but keeping that focus can be really difficult if you're in front of the camera and you're not having someone operate it. So on a camera like that, you have to manually do focus or there was a great way to use the, the shutter button to grab a quick focus each time Obviously, you've got to be editing that. But if you're sitting in front of the camera, talking to it just like I am right now, and you want it to continuously keep you in focus, you're going to need another camera that does it well, like I said, 70D and on up, or cameras that released after that. 77D, I think they have now. They have all kinds of Rebel cameras. A lots of cameras that you can afford, but you either have to upgrade, which is one of the reasons why I went to the Sony a6500, because it does have good continuous autofocus. That's something I wanted to be able to do and not have to worry about, am I in focus when I move? Otherwise, you gotta plant yourself in one spot, get your focus, record, and stay there until the next shot. He says as he checks his focus. Am I in focus? I hope so. Ronaldo, question, do you shoot in RAW or JPEG, which is best? This is a question I got a lot, and I put this in here. I got it so much that I actually made a video about it, which you can see on this channel. And this is not a feature. You'll see this on the 60D. I'm not sure this option moved up through the 80D and later cameras. I think it might have. This is for photos. 
And especially on the 60D, that setting where I said I could click a picture, you can't do that on the 80D when you're in video mode, but you could snap a picture while you were filming and the raw versus JPEG setting in the menu, that's what that was for. Do you wanna shoot a raw image or a JPEG image? And so it doesn't matter in video. You can set that to what you want. You're going to be shooting essentially JPEG. It's video, it's, you know, your camera does 24 megapixels or whatever. It's doing 1080p video. It's only using two megapixels to shoot that. So no raw video. You could use Magic Lantern. I know some of you out there will say, use Magic Lantern on some Canon cameras and it lets you shoot raw. I've never played with it, so um, never really needed to. But Magic Lantern is awesome, don't get me wrong. But use at your own risk, even though it's stable. But yeah, that's what that setting is. Raw versus JPEG doesn't matter for video. Knowledge is treasure, great video. I don't know what video this is for. I need to make sure I make a note of that. <laughs> I just wanted to ask, do we leave the focus switch on the lens on AF, autofocus, or M, manual, and stabilizer on or off? It depends on what you're doing. So if you want, if you have a camera, like I mentioned, that does continuous autofocus, obviously leave it in AF. That thing on the 60D where I mentioned I used the shutter to grab the quick focus. It was a quick focus setting. You could press the shutter, grab your focus, and then I would record. And I would do that as I, if I was shooting an event or something and moving around fast, or even B-roll to make sure I was in focus and I could get focus quick without having to adjust it. And I didn't have focus peaking like the 6500 and other cameras do now. So leave it in autofocus if you're doing that. You could leave it in manual if you have continuous autofocus. So I'm not really sure exactly what camera and what lens you're using here, but the stabilizer, if you're on a tripod like I am now, tonight I turned off the image stabilization. You don't want the camera trying to figure out, uh, is this stable, do I need to fix this when it's locked down on a tripod? So if you're on a tripod, or you're on some other stabilizer, I've often thought about, hmm, on a gimbal or even a monopod where there is some movement, should I use stabilizer? I have, but be careful you don't see weird results. What I've seen on a tripod, if I left the image stabilization on and I tried to do a panning motion, you'll get some weird jerky moves. And in the beginning, I couldn't figure out what was going on. I thought my camera was broken. It was because the image stabilizer was on. I was trying to pan and the image stabilizer when it was already stabilized on a tripod or even just stabilized really well in your hands was having a problem with that. So if you're just hand holding and getting your shot, image stabilization works fantastic. So just depends on exactly what you're shooting. Bizarre, I don't know if I said that right. Sorry if I didn't. Do I need an external microphone for video recordings for short movies? So especially for short movies, yes, because it's a movie. And audio is so important. You don't want bad audio distracting from the movie you've worked so hard on. But in all cases, an external microphone, the key there, you see I'm wearing a microphone, which today I'm actually messing around with the Rode Filmmaker. It's digital instead of um, analog, which there is some interference in here. The digital should overcome that. It's a cool setup. It's affordable lab that you can get into. But having the microphone close to the source, which is my mouth, that's the key to getting good audio. The camera's only, I don't know, six feet away from me, but if I was using audio from the camera, either built in on the microphones up there, or even if I had something like a Rode Video Micro, Video Micro, which I have here, I've been messing around with, or I had something like the Rode Video Mic Pro, it wouldn't sound good because it would, my voice would bounce all around before it got to that microphone, and it's just far away. So, do you need an external microphone? Pretty much for everything. The key is you want to be close. Oftentimes the microphones inside cameras are not that good. You can get away with them for like ambient sounds. I find they do really good for environmental sounds if you're just out shooting. Stereo microphones oftentimes on the cameras, that sounds good. But for the most part, any kind of external microphone put on the camera is going to be better, especially when you're close to the uh, camera. But Again, that microphone, no matter what, needs to be close to the person talking. And so in a short movie setup that like you're planning to do or have already done probably, you'd wanna get probably a shotgun microphone so you don't have to have a lab for every single person and someone to operate that. You need a boom operator, someone that can hold the microphone over the person speaking. Run that into an audio recorder 
and basically make that wireless. Let them monitor the audio recording. Someone else takes care of the recording uh, of audio when you're trying to shoot a movie. Friend of the pod. Are you a friend of the pod? Wink. Lester, can this tutorial apply to any other Canon camera too? So I assume this is probably one of the setup videos. Again, I didn't note which video this was from. That's a fail on my part, but I have it here because it's important because yes, the answer is yes. So if this was a setup video for the 60D, the 70D, the 80D, for the most part, most of the setup is going to be the same. Each camera has some features that are a little different, but what I try to do with all my tutorials is actually remove the gear as much as possible from the process and that anybody who watches that video should be able to learn something about making video and they can take away from that video and go apply it to any camera they have. So that's really what I try to do with my videos. And I think that comes through because you can see that when we're doing setup, I'm teaching you things like how to set up a shutter, you know, doing shutter speed, aperture, ISO. These things do carry over to not only any Canon camera, but any camera where you have manual settings. So yes, you can watch any of those videos and most of the stuff applies. And of course, if you have one of those cameras, I talk about the special features of that camera for video as well. So yes. Soccer Saint Av, what's a good lens that will capture half your body without being too close to the camera? So this is a good one because when I started shooting, the space I'm in now, it's a little bigger, but when I started shooting, I was in your standard bedroom. It was in my office, but it was bedroom size in my house. And if you're shooting, you have a lens on your DSLR and the camera again is maybe four feet, five feet from you. You might, you know, trying to get a little separation from the background. You don't have that much room. You're using something like a 50 millimeter lens, which I believe I started with. I had a kit lens, it was 18. Yeah, but I remember having the problem. I got, it was the first lens I got with a good aperture, which was 1.4, and that was a 50 millimeter Canon. It's a great lens. But I couldn't shoot anything except that was really tight because the 60D that I had it on was a, is a crop sensor camera. The Sony 6500, A6500 that I have on right now is also crop sensor. So just because it says 50 millimeters, that's not what you're going to get. That's for full frame if that's the type of lens it is. Actually, even an APS-C lens, you're going to have to figure in the crop. So when you put it on a crop sensor camera, you don't have a full sensor like a 5D or a 6D or an A7S, something like that then you're going to have to take into consideration usually like a 1.5 1.6 check your camera for the crop on my 60d it was 1.6 times so instead of 50 millimeters which is a nice focal length on a full frame i'm shooting closer to 85 millimeters you can do the math do you want me to do the math for you right now because i'm in front of my computer i can just pull up the calculator and we'd go 50 times our crop factor of 1.6 80 millimeters. So I was shooting at 80 millimeters. So you're only getting like this and you'd have to back up really far in order to get half of your body in the shot. So I went to a 30 millimeter 1.4, which if you do the math on that one, you have your 30 millimeters times your 1.6, you get a 48 millimeter lens, which is that 50 was kind of where we were at before we put on a crop sensor. That's nice. I could be in a average size bedroom size space and I could not have to be too far away from my camera and I could still capture kind of what you're seeing now, head to waist at the desk here, but you get it. Easier to get yourself in the shot. So 30 millimeters is a great length. Sigma has some nice lenses, 24 millimeters. Right now you're seeing this on a Sony 28 millimeter F2 and that's a great focal range, especially for the Sony because it has clear image zoom so I can turn my 28 uh, what is it up to two times? So you take the 28, you know, I can turn that into a 56. So it's a prime lens that becomes a zoom lens without really any resolution loss. So pretty cool feature. And for any of the gear that I mentioned, if you want to see the exact gear I'm talking about, check the links as long as it's not discontinued. Some of this is old. I'll try to put a replacement in there, but check the links in the description. It's all there. And important to note something I actually kind of just learned recently that 1.6 crop factor doesn't just apply to the focal length of your lens. You actually have to multiply the aperture by the crop factor. 
So in the case of that Sigma that I mentioned, the 30 millimeters, 1.4, I'm not actually getting 1.4 when I put it on a crop sensor. My aperture, my widest aperture it's going to let in the most light is actually apparently like 2.24 so that's important to know you lose some aperture as well i haven't noticed this to be a limitation i still get extremely shallow depth of field with apertures that are 2.8 1.8 1.4 i didn't even know this until more recently wasn't doing this but apparently that's the case just something to know i haven't seen a huge difference I need a star accommodated. I think I have a ways to go before I can trust manual settings. For a noob like myself, I don't want to ruin my videos because I don't really know much about cameras. Smiley face. And yeah, I get it. And I answered to her, the only way to learn is to just do it. So the key is you have to shoot a lot. And I told her, shoot a bunch of stuff that'll never make it past your editing suite. Um, just let it be fun and you need to go out and make the mistakes so that you can see what you're doing wrong You won't be able to get it right until you know what's wrong or how I've pushed it too far if I've overexposed it You need to know what that looks like and where you can be just under that or Way below that and bring it up in post-production uh, You need to really learn that shooting at f 1.4 is probably not a good idea a lot of the times because it's going to be almost impossible to get stuff in focus and you'll find a lot of the shots where you did that and maybe this button was in focus and down here this word was not and you really actually wanted at least the whole surface of that item to be in focus and it wasn't so you would have been better off at a higher f-stop i've really learned that shooting like f4 f5.6 4.5 like those are good apertures because you can still get decent shallow depth of field doesn't have to be completely blurry. If you get just that separation where the background's a little blurry, which these cameras, DSLRs give you, mirrorless cameras, especially if you're doing a little bit of, you know, if you have a zoom lens a little bit, if you've got a long focal length, it'll drop that background out. So just a subtle hint on most shots is gonna be enough to give that pop, that thing that distinguishes a interchangeable lens, big sensor camera from something like an iPhone. Looking at my iPhone. So go shoot a ton, make a bunch of mistakes. That's what you want to do. So that's the only one real way you're gonna to learn to be manual. You can't think, oh, I understand it all now from the videos or the manual or people telling me you have to do it. The only way to learn it is to do it. If you guys haven't hit the like button, but you're still here, Nylat, I hope that's right. Kind of the same question that he or she has a 60D, still confused how to focus properly because most of my videos turn out blurry unless it's a landscape vid, probably because you're at a higher aperture and everything's in focus. Uh, is it a problem with the lens or the camera? That I don't know, of course, it's always possible, but it's probably back to that thing where you're shooting too wide open. You're using F2 and only a, one small piece of your image is in focus. So you're missing focus a lot of times. And if you have a camera like the 60D, which you do, you don't have focus peaking. You can punch in to see critical focus before you start recording, and I did a video about that. And that can show you, but you'll see how hard it is to keep something in focus. Even something that's stationary, try, and here's the thing. Some lenses, a lot of lenses, at their widest apertures, 1.4 if that's the max, or f2, or 2.8, your image is not gonna be as sharp. It's sharper at a couple f-stops above that. So if it's a 1.4 lens, it probably looks its best at f2.8. So try that out with your lens, see if that helps. But again, just increase your aperture until you learn how to focus a little better, or you'll just learn that actually that's the look you're looking for. V8LC100. I'm using Rode VideoMic Pro with my 650D and the autofocus of the lens is so loud that the mic picks it up way too much. How do I get good audio and video that stays in focus? Kind of two questions there. We talked a lot about keeping your video in focus. Uh, so heed those pieces of advice. As far as the lens, yeah, if you don't have an STM, well, if you don't have the STM motor inside your camera, the 650D being older, 
something like the 70D or 80D that has STM inside and then the lens is STM, it's virtually quiet for a lot of those. I tested out recently the Canon M, some M lenses on the M6 and this 15 to 45, it's STM and it's quiet. So the microphone being right over the top of it, even when it's focusing is not much of an issue, but the STM that's F2, I think it's still on the camera, in the house of course, it is noisier and you can hear it. So it depends on the lens completely. So there are lenses that you can get that are a lot quieter. But again, it goes back to that question about having the microphone on top of the camera. The best audio is gonna come from getting that microphone, in most cases, away from the camera. So if you can do that, a lav mic, a boom mic, something that's not on the camera, that can be tricky. But even having a lav, cheaper lav mic that you put in a recorder and it's completely separate sound that you have to sync in post-production, sometimes, a lot of times, that's actually better. You'll, end, you'll get better results even though you have to work a little harder. So you gotta get that microphone away from the lens if you don't have an option to not use a noisy lens or you have to manual focus. Can't use autofocus, you have to manual focus. And again, on the 60D or the 650D without focus peaking, the red lines that show you when you're focused, that's gonna be tough. So you have a bit of a compromise to do there, but a couple different options. Fido, Fido, again, everyone, sorry if I slaughtered names. I should probably not say names out loud, but I'm trying to, you know, I like to use people's first names in the comments when I answer you, because everyone says, hey, Ray. So I like to say, hey, back. So that's so awesome, by the way, when you guys comment and actually use my name. It, it feels like we're talking to each other. I like that a lot. Uh, he asks, could you tell me the best setting for dialogue recording and ambience recording using the Zoom H6? I said, there's no one setting because you have to set up the gain based on your microphone and your environment. However, it's best to try and stay below seven on the gain knob to get the cleanest audio. So on the Zoom H6 specifically, I find once you turn up the gain knob for your channel, whatever channel you're using, once you turn that up past seven, it starts to introduce a little bit of noise. Even though preamps are still pretty good and it's probably not much, you can definitely go over it. But if I can keep it below seven, I do. However, what's important when you're turning this up and down is the level that you're getting into the audio meter. What is that showing? And a lot of times there'll be a minus 12 demarcation on the audio meter. It's there because the manufacturer's telling you this is a pretty much a sweet spot for your audio to be. You have a lot of room left over in case you get really loud, you don't peak your audio, but it's also loud enough that you're far enough from the ambience, the noise floor of the room that you're in, if it's quiet where you're at, that you're gonna have clean audio. So I did a video on setting up audio recorders, no matter what you have, kind of based on this audio meter and where you wanna be, definitely check out that video. That'll help a lot. But specifically with the Zoom H6, that seven is good if you can stay below it. Of course, you wanna get your levels. And you can be below 12. You don't have to hit that. As long as you're anywhere in that neighborhood, even around minus 18, the preamps are good enough. The dynamic range and separation between the noise floor, it's pretty low, is gonna be good enough where I've raised that audio plus 19 dB in post and still had it nice and clean, at least for recorders in its range. So don't stress too much. Just try to get good gain staging from the start. Go on from there, it'll be good. All right, Jeem video series. Last question, what about vlog settings? Just use auto for doing stuff like that? I did a video about that. Again, I'm trying to pull out some of the more common questions, also probably reasons why I make videos about it. But I did a video, auto settings in vlogs are going to be usually what you want. So I tend to use auto ISO, and then I try to use shutter priority on your camera, TV on a Canon, and you can put it in shutter priority on the Sony, TV being time value, shutter, whatever. That's your shutter priority. So I try to use that. So I want the shutter to be the same so that the motion blur is always the same, and then the aperture I'll set to auto and the ISO to auto. So no matter where I go, if it's from dark to really light, the camera can handle that and make the switch for me. I'm less concerned in a vlog setup about shallow depth of field. I know that I can get that if I want. You can get close to the camera, but for the most part, you want the camera to adjust to whatever environment you're in. You want it to keep you in focus. 
And the best way to do that is that's auto setup. That's the auto setup I would use. Shutter priority, set your shutter 1 50th. I've actually been shooting a lot at 1 80th because I kind of like the look. Try things, be different. So uh, whatever you want your shutter to be, set it there, leave it, let the camera do the other settings and you should be happy with the results, especially in a vlog format, specifically a vlog format, actually. Auto white balance, again, that's a case where I would use auto white balance. Okay, I always say ask your questions in the comments. I'll see you next time, but ask your questions in the comments. That's how I got these. They were in the comments. I answered them, and then I picked them out, put them on this. But yeah, if you're still here, like, subscribe. That helps the channel grow but definitely ask your questions about anything that I covered on this first AVQA or any other questions you have about any other videos, and then I can get them into these segments. See you next time.